Okay, are we ready to find the church? I am so ready to find them, and I saw stuff studying this week that I'd never seen before. And so this is, uh, I'm just excited. So let's get started on the lesson we're going to find the church during the tribulation period, and I want to be able to show it biblically. Because if I can't show it biblically, I might as well not say it, right? And if I'm going to believe it, I need to prove it here. So I'm ready to show where the church is during the tribulation period. Uh, now, if we go to 1 Corinthians 10.32, which we have done in the past a few weeks ago, Paul really lays out for us that there are three groups of people ethnically. And he divides them in verse 32. He says, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether they're a Jew whether they are a Gentile, which at that time would be an unbeliever, or whether they're part of the church. So Paul divides them for us into these three groups of people. You're either Jewish, or you're a Gentile unbeliever, or you are part of the church. Okay, so those are the three groups of people we want to look at during the tribulation period. If I look at this period biblically, we know that God had a specific purpose for the Jewish people. Is that true? Yes, yes. and we get that from Daniel 9.24, where the angel Gabriel came to Daniel while he's praying, tapped him on the shoulder, and he said, Daniel, God has ordained 70 weeks which is 490 years, right? Because each week is seven years. 490 years that are for the Jewish people and for the city of Jerusalem. Is that pretty clear who this is for? Very clear. And so we know also as we study in the book of Revelation, this tribulation period, when I look in the book of Revelation, every so often it talks about the wrath that's being poured out upon the earth dwellers. So these are the people that are the unbelievers. We went back to the Old Testament a week or two ago and showed that earth dwellers is always people that are rebelling against God. They shake their fist, and even as he pours out the wrath upon them of the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, they will not repent. In fact, they get more angry, shake their fist, become more rebellious. They're the ones who will... Uh, take the mark of the beast and they're the ones who will worship satan and then they will be cast into the lake of fire because these will be your goats at that judgment so we know his purpose for the jews and his purpose for the earth dwellers now we are going to take a lot of puzzle pieces and a lot of clues today because the third group that paul mentioned is the church so God had a purpose for the Jews. He had a purpose for these earth dwellers or the Gentiles. And does he have a purpose for the church during the tribulation period? I want to show it biblically. I know we're gone, and I think we've been making a case, but I think this is going to put a nail in it. So we want to look for where is the church. I made a reference like last week, where's Waldo? Well, this is the same thing, except in this case, Waldo is really the church. So we're looking for all the clues, all the puzzle pieces, because I want to know firmly that I can go to Scripture and say, this proves that the church is not in the tribulation period. So let's get started. We're going to be in the book of Revelation quite a bit today, which will excite some people. Revelation 1 we're starting in chapter 1 and remember John who wrote this because it was dictated to him by Jesus Christ and so he's inspired and he writes down what he's told he's on the Isle of Patmos in exile because the Roman Emperor has exiled him there so that's our scene and in verse 10 John says I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great sound like a trumpet. And it said to me, I am Alpha, I am Omega. I'm the first and the last. 
Now we know that is who? That is Jesus Christ himself. Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Now I'm going to have a lot of graphics up here, which if you'll look up once in a while, I think it will help you in your mind to have the scene of what's going on. And he said, John said, I turned, because where was the voice coming from? Behind him. So he said he turned, and as he turned to see the voice that was speaking with him and being turned, this is what he sees. He said, I see seven golden candlesticks, which are also called the lampstands. Are you all with me? Okay, so he sees seven golden lampstands or candlesticks, and where are they? In the midst of those seven candlesticks, who does he see? One like unto the Son of Man. We know that that's how Jesus referred to himself when he was on earth, the Son of Man. So then in verse 19, those of you who do not know about verse 19 in Revelation 1, there, God is going to give John an outline of the whole book. So verse 19, we look at the outline, and he says, John, I want you to write down the things that you have seen. What was he seeing? That vision of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to write down the things that are. John lived in the church age. The church, it was about 95 A.D., and the church age had started with... Uh, the day of Pentecost back in about 33 A.D. So we've been in the church age, and he says, I want you to write the things that are, that's present, what's going on, and that's going to be the church age. And then he says, then you're going to write down the things that will take place after these. What are these? The things you have seen and the things that are. And now I'm going to show you what is going to happen afterwards. So here you can see his vision in Revelation 1. He sees a vision, and he gives a lot of graphic detail in chapter 1. He's dressed in white. He has a gold sash around him. His feet are of bronze, and it says he has hair white like wool. And he says it's the Son of Man. This is Jesus Christ, and he is standing in the midst of, this is important, the midst of these candlesticks or the lampstands. Now, in the next verse, in chapter 2 and 3, he says, John, you're going to write the things that are. And if you know Revelation 2 and 3, this is where he writes the letters to the seven churches. Jesus dictates the letters that John's to write down. And these are the seven churches that were in um, Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Okay? Okay. Then he says, now, after the church age, you're going to write down, starting in chapter 4, you're going to write down everything after the church age. And he'll start in chapter 4, verse 1, clear to the end of the book. So there's our outline that he gave him in verse 19. Now, just so we are not confused, in verse 20, after his outline, Jesus tells him, he said, now there's a mystery about these seven stars. There's a mystery about those seven lampstands, and I'm going to tell you exactly what they are so we don't have to try to figure it out. And he says, the seven stars that are in his hands, they are the angels of the seven churches. And then he said, those lampstands are who? The seven churches. So we know when we see the lampstand or the candlestick, it is the church. All right. Now, I'm just reiterating this so we know we have it firm in our mind. Our outline, chapter 1, I'm writing, John said, the things that I have seen, and he has seen that vision, and he describes it in a lot of detail. Chapter 2, he's writing about the things that are, and he writes the letters to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. So he covers all of the churches which are an indication and they are a symbol of the history of the church age. And even today, you will find churches that look like the church of Ephesus or Smyrna or whatever. They're all through the ages. Now, the word church in Greek is ecclesia. 
it is used 20 times in the book of Revelation. 20 times, the church. In my whole book of Revelation, I look, and I'm going to find Ecclesia 20 times. 19 of those times are in chapter 2 and 3 when he's talking to the churches. I've only got one time left they're going to be mentioned. Revelation 22. They're not mentioned to the very end of the book. Is that significant? That's absolutely significant. Now, so I have a little sequence for you here, and this is what we're going to be looking at. Chapter 4 of Revelation, I believe we can show that the church is raptured to heaven and they arrive in the throne room of God. Yes, chapter 5, I think we'll see the church in heaven and they are worshiping. They are worshiping God. And then in chapter 6, now the first seal is going to be broken. Jesus Christ is the only one that can break the seal, right? We know the commands come from the throne of God. We learned about that. And there are four living creatures around the throne of God. And each one of them, of the first four seals, says what? Come and see. And I'll address that next week, Nancy. <laughs> Nancy had a question. She thought I'm talking to horses. So <laughs> we will. She asked me that. And I thought, I, I did say that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct that next week. Okay, now the absence of the ecclesia from Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, clear to chapter 22, that is consistent if I have a pre-trib view of the church. If I believe the church is gone here and they're not mentioned through that whole tribulation period, that really is significant because that lines up with having a pre-trib view. You understand what a pre-trib view is? I believe the church is gone before the tribulation starts. All right. Now, remember he said, those of us that were here for this lesson about two weeks ago, to the church of Philadelphia, here was the promise. I will keep you from that hour of testing. This is an hour that's going to come up on who? It's the whole world to test those who are dwelling. Do you see your earth dwellers again? Okay, so we know the purpose. It's an hour going to come up on the whole world, test those that are dwelling on the earth. Now, if you'll look at my uh, screen up here, you and I believe that there is going to be a rapture of the church, right? Okay, this is when, that's the top one, this is when Jesus comes in the clouds. Not every eye will see him because he's not coming to earth. He only comes in the clouds and it says there will be a trump and there will be the shout of the archangel and we will be told to come up and he will gather us to him. Now, the other event, that's kind of part, we'll call it phase one of his second coming. But then phase two is out here after the seven-year tribulation period is over, and that's the bottom picture. He's coming, and it says in Revelation 19, it says heaven is going to open. And it says, what are we going to see? We see him on a white horse. His garments are stained with blood. And it says he has the army of heaven with him, and they are dressed in white raiment on these horses. And now he's coming. Every eye is going to see him. Many will be trembling. They will be in fear of the one who is now coming to enter in, onto the earth. He will step down on the Mount of Olives. He's going to destroy every enemy and set up his kingdom. Now, I believe we know of two things that have to happen in between those two things. Between the rapture and something out here, we've got two things that have to happen. So there's got to be a time interval. So people that believe we're out here, here's the rapture, whoop, we go up and we turn around and come back. There's no time for these two things that have to take place in heaven. We can show they're going to take place in heaven. Event number one is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if I look at all the scriptures in the Bible that talk about the second coming, him coming to the Mount of Olives, him coming on the white horse, and him coming to set up his kingdom, there is never one mention 
of the judgment seat in context near that passage. The, those passages are free of any talk about the judgment seat. Significant? Yes, yes. shake your head yes. It is significant. <laughs> so we want to see, can we look and now find a biblical passage that indicates the judgment seat is after the rapture, but before the second coming? If I don't believe the rapture is still out here, when is there time for the judgment seat for us to be evaluated? I don't know. So let's go to Paul's writings in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. On the judgment seat of Christ, he says, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, we want to be well-pleasing to him when we arrive at that judgment seat. He said, For we must all, he's talking to believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, flag the next two words, each one. This is an individual thing. Each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, and bad doesn't mean wicked or evil. It means worthless. Because there's a lot of stuff you and I do that is worthless. Y'all don't do any? <laughs> worthless for the judgment seat of Christ. Okay. Now, if I go to 1 Corinthians 3, Paul is still talking. And he says, every one of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I hope all of you are born again. And that you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And who is our foundation of our faith? Jesus Christ. Now, as we live our Christian life, we have choices of how to build our life on the foundation. We have choices of gold, silver, and precious jewels, choices of wood, hay, and stubble. And so we are building on our foundation every day of our life. We're building on it. And then it tells us in verse 13, notice the words again, every man, that's individual. Every man's work is going to be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it's going to be revealed by fire. The fire is going to try every man's work of what sort or the quality of it. It does not tell us how the quantity, how much. We want to know the, the quality of the work. Now this is real important in verse 14 and 15. So here, I've got my foundation just like you, and I have been building on my life, on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And he says, if your work abides, when it comes out of the fire, he says, if you have works that, have, that abide still and they're not burned up, so you have precious jewels and gold and silver, he says, you will receive a reward. Okay? But if your work is burned holy, it says, he is going to suffer loss. Why? Are there rewards and positions and crowns and inheritance waiting for each one of us? Yes, but it says that we can still have our foundation, but our life has been worthless as far as doing things for the Lord, being obedient to sanctification. So I show up and my life comes out and it's like nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. It says he will suffer loss. There are things that we can lose, but he himself will be Saved. That is an important thing for us to remember, yet so as by fire. A preacher I used to listen to said, some are going to show up with their tail feathers burning. <laughs> so that was just his way of saying, it says, so as by fire. It also says in 1 John 2.28, I think it is, that many are going to be ashamed at his coming. I think all of us will probably have some sense of shame or remorse that we were not more faithful, that we should, have, we should have been more obedient to be in the Word, to memorize it, to study it, to show ourselves approved, because a lot of us are, will go out and do a lot of works, correct? How faithful are we to get in the Word, memorize it, study it? 
let him sanctify us and change us into the image of Christ. So right after the, our works going in the fire, a couple of verses later, here's what he says. It is required that you and I be found faithful. And then what does he say two verses later? You are to judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light He's going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness when he comes, and he will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and every man shall have praise of God. Now, even those with their tail feathers burning, why? They have the foundation. They put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, what is the second thing that has to take place in heaven before the second coming? And that is the marriage of the Lamb. It takes place in heaven before the second coming, but it has to take place after the judgment seat. So let's look at that. If I go to Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 7, it says, We're going to rejoice and be glad. This is before heaven opens. We're rejoicing and being glad and give the glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb, the Lamb is Jesus Christ, the marriage has come, and the bride has made herself ready. And to her, it's going to be granted that she'll be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And then we don't have to guess what the linen is. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So I've been to the judgment seat, and I am going to be given some fine linen, white and clean, and... How's my evaluation over here? We all have a garment of justification, true. That's his robe of righteousness. I'm not seeing as many heads agreeing with me now. Remember, I taught and I believe that we are involved in the making of our sanctification garment. People are going to, I believe it, I think it's clear to me, although it doesn't say it specifically, I believe that people are going to be given different amounts for their wedding garment based on the judgment seat of Christ. Okay. Now, it tells us, it tells us point blank, the fine linen clean and white represents the righteous acts of the saints was it an individual judgment? Every man. And now that we've been to the judgment seat, it's been judged, our life has been judged and purified at the judgment seat of Christ. Y'all hanging with me? Now, verse 11. Now heaven's going to open. And he says, Behold, there's a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he's coming right to judge and make war, and then he'll be setting up his kingdom. Okay? Now, look at verse 14. The armies of heaven are following him, and they're riding on a white horse, and how are they dressed? In the fine linen, white and clean. Who is that? That's the... That's the bride. It's the bride. And where has she gotten the fine linen, white and clean? Based on her righteous acts. Are y'all following all this? Okay. Now, let us rejoice and be glad we're at the marriage of the Lamb in heaven before he comes back, and we have been given fine linen, white and clean. It's our righteous acts which were determined at the judgment seat of Christ when we were evaluated. Each person is evaluated. Notice the presentation of the bride is not occurring in the clouds. Where was it? In heaven. The presentation of the bride was not on earth. It's in heaven. So if you say the rapture is way out here at his second coming to earth, when did all this happen? When did it all happen? I mean, it just makes... And I know time is different there than here. I know that. But it does not make any sense to me that all that can happen and us be ready to come back with him if we've just gone up with him. Are y'all with me? Yeah, I'm glad... Okay. Y'all's brain is a lot like mine, maybe. Okay, so here's the event. The bride's getting ready to be 
she's uh, been being presented the event of the marriage of the lamb is right before the lord jesus christ descends from heaven and he's coming to conquer the world set up his kingdom to be king of kings and lord of lords and we are with him and we have on fine linen clean and white that we received based on our evaluation at the judgment seat everybody follow all that i believe the bible teaches that now the believers in heaven are wearing the garments which represent their rewards the righteous acts of the saints now because the rewarded bride we're going to accompany jesus back to earth it's necessary that we went up to heaven at some point and all of this happened y'all follow that i didn't see every head shake okay now you and i so i'm done with that now we're going to go to revelation 4 and find out what's in heaven in revelation 4 this is the first mention of the throne room of god this is a scene right after i believe the rapture which is basically given in chapter 4 verse 1 when heaven opens and i think we're going to have that so here we're going to go after the church age and now is john in chapter 4 writing the things which are going to be after the church age right chapter 4 so in chapter 4 and 5 we have this throne room scene and i've got some pretty good pictures that i think will help you see and visualize what this might be like he's got four different groups that he is going to talk about in chapter 4 he's going to talk about god himself being seated on a throne he's going to talk about 24 elders and he's going to talk about four living creatures and he's going to introduce the lamb lion the lamb as though it had been slain so those are the four things we're going to see in chapter 4 so verse 1 john says after this what has john just finished in chapter 3 talking to the church at laodicea which is the last church so after this john says i looked and behold a door opens in heaven so here i've got a picture can you imagine he looks and a door is opened in heaven and the voices of the trumpet says to him come up hither i think that's a picture of us being raptured now it says in verse 1 the first voice that i heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me and it said come up hither what reason now i'm going to show you things which have to be hereafter after what the church age that he's just been writing about so instantly john finds himself in the spirit he's standing before the throne of god at the end of the church age and this is what he is going to see what is john's view and i've given you another artist rendition so you can kind of look at this and picture what this throne room in the artist's mind could look like according to how the bible describes it so what does the bible say immediately john said i'm in the spirit and behold a throne is set in heaven one is sitting on the throne and he that was sitting on it looked like a jasper and a sardine stone and there's a rainbow around the throne that looks like emerald so here's another artist rendition we can just kind of get a little bit of a picture of what it might look like this throne room in heaven now verse four round about the throne are four and twenty seats upon the seats i see four and twenty elders and they're clothed in white raiment interesting okay so here is the throne room of god if you look up here you can see the throne room at the in the picture and it looks like the rainbow around it you see the four living creatures with the wings and then you see on each side there's going to be 24 elders they're sitting on 24 thrones and they have on white garments so here's what john sees in the throne room 
And he says, round about the throne, I see 24 seats. Upon the seats, I see 24 elders. They're clothed in white raiment. They're sitting on a throne, and on their head, they have a crown of gold. Interesting. We need to see who they are, and can I, with confidence, say who I think they are? So there's 24 elders on their own thrones. Do you see I have two big gold circles so you can kind of see? I know it's hard to see. There's 24 of them. They have their own throne. They're in white raiment, and they have crowns on their head. Now, it is not surprising these 24 elders have crowns. This shows they had to have already been at the judgment seat of Christ to receive the rewards for their Christian service from Jesus Christ himself. Is he going to be our judge at the judgment seat? Yes. Individual. Every man. Now, verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. Now, this is a really good picture up here that I found. We talked about the four living creatures before, and these are the ones that when seal number one, two, three, and four are open, one of the four living creatures around the throne says, come and see. So there's your four living creatures, and it's on a sea, it says, that was like glass unto crystal. So that's a pretty good picture. Uh, of thinking what they might be. We're told in other places they had four different faces. One was the face of a man, one the face of uh, an eagle, and one the face of a lion, and I think the third, fourth one is, was it a bull? I think that's what that's supposed to be, or an ox, something like that. Okay, now, I want you to keep noticing. In the midst of the throne... And round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now, I have a question. That's John's vision of the throne room of God. I want to go back to the Old Testament and compare his vision with the visions in the Old Testament. So are there other Bible descriptions of the throne of God in the Old Testament? Let's go see what those prophets said. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. <clears throat> He's sitting upon a throne that's high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And you can see that in this picture. So, and then he goes on to say, Above him are seraphim. Each had six wings, Two wings they covered their face, two wings they covered their feet, and two wings were used for flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's Isaiah's description of the throne room. When I go to Daniel 7, 9 through 10, is another description of the throne room of God. And he says in verse 9, While I was watching thrones were set up the ancient of days took his seat his attire was white like snow the hair of his head was like lamb's wool his throne was ablaze with fire and the wheels were all aflame and there is a river of fire streaming forth and proceeding from his presence so he has said there are other thrones, there are myriads of all kinds of angelic beings, but he gives no specific name or designation of any other group seated on any throne. If I go to Ezekiel 1 and again in Ezekiel 10, I have two more descriptions. And he spends a lot of time describing the four living creatures in detail. So I have a question. There's a group in Revelation who were never seen in the throne room in the Old Testament. Who are they? How did they get there? And when did they show up? Can you see that there's a group missing? John sees them, but they were never seen in the Old Testament. So that's what we're going to develop. 
Now, according to John MacArthur, there are many commentators that believe the 24... Oh, that's the group, in case you didn't catch it. It's the 24 elders that are all of a sudden in heaven, in the throne room of God, before the throne. Now, some believe the 24 elders are angels. And the question is asked, do you think this is a viable option? The word elder in Greek is presbyteros. It is never used in scripture to refer to an angel. It always refers to a man. So we can put the angels over here. The term elder speaks of older men in general. And in fact, the rulers in Israel and the rulers of churches were called elders. You never see an angel wearing a crown. Do these 24 elders have on a crown? Yes. And an elder is a, usually a designation for an official in the church. Now, the 24 elders, this is my belief, and I think I put that in the notes, and then we're going to see if we can show it. The 24 elders represent the church who has been raptured in Revelation 4. Then I think the 24 elders are going to be shown in chapter 5 around the throne of God involved in worship. And then chapter 6, now God's wrath is going to be loosed on the earth, on the nation of Israel, and on those that dwell on the earth. But the church, I believe, is, we can show is already in heaven before chapter 6 ever happens. So I've got this group of elders... And if I can identify this group firmly and confidently, it will help you and I grasp the timing of the rapture. The uniqueness of this group should give you and I tremendous encouragement and comfort if we can say, look, that's us. That is us in chapter 4 and 5. We're in the throne room before the tribulation period ever starts in chapter 6. So, in Revelation 24, we finally see this group of 24. They are seated on their own throne. They're dressed in white raiment. They have crowns on their head, and they were not present in any vision in the Old Testament. That's what I want you to see right now. Okay, there's 24 of them. The 24 elders are going to be mentioned in the book of Revelation 12 times. Is that significant? Yes, because... 12 is the number of government. When God set up different government things, did he have 12 tribes of Israel? And then he's going to have 12 disciples and apostles. So 12 is a number significant throughout the Bible that is related to government, and there, the elders are going to be mentioned 12 times. Now, I believe this is the church come to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. Don't forget, I don't want you to forget this because it's important. I had four visions of the throne room in the Old Testament. They are never there. They only show up with John in chapter 4 and 5. So it seems these 24 elders, they, it seems, where'd they come from? Who are they? How did they get there? And when did they get there? If I compare them with other descriptions of throne rooms in the Bible. So, 12 is considered a perfect number in the Bible. It symbolizes God's power and authority. It serves as a perfect foundational government. We think he, he set 12 tribes. He had a reason. The 12 disciples, 12 apostles. It can also symbolize the completeness of a group such as the nation of Israel as a whole. Now, there's 24 elders the number 24, you and I have to go to 1 Chronicles. See, do you have to study the whole counsel of God to put all the pieces together? Yes, and so that's what we're attempting to do. And if I go to 1 Chronicles 24 and 25, I'm going to find the number 24. Significant, and it's related to priesthood and to worship. And this is according to John MacArthur. I took some of his notes. So in 1 Chronicles 24, verses 4 and 5, and then 7 through 18, David and Zadok, who was the priestly line that was uh, faithful to David, 
and they're going to have a higher position in the millennium, the priest line of Zadok, than the priest line of Levi because they were faithful to David. David and Zadok divided the priesthood into how many different orders? 24. So they have 24 officers in their sanctuary that represent the 24 courses of the Levitical priest. So when he asks for the priest to come, the whole group doesn't show up. I have 24 that represent us. You see that? 24 represent the whole group. Now, it says in 1 Chronicles 24, 19, these, this group, had as their appointed duty in their service, they were the ones that would come into the house of the Lord, the 24. So David now divides worship leaders in 1 Chronicles 25. How many different groups? 24. So when the 24 chief priest of the 24 different orders stood before David, we are here to represent the entire priesthood. But he only needs how many to represent him? Hello. Good. I want you all to say that so it's in your brain. I'm representing the whole, all of us, but he only needs 24 to represent the whole group. That is significant for us to understand as we go forward. This is the same for the worship leaders. There, remember, he had singers and people that played this and played that, and so he had all these people involved in worship. But when he was going to speak to them, how many did he need to represent the whole group? 24. So y'all have that down. Good. So there's a pattern here. 24 is representative of the whole group. So can you imagine how many believers since the day of Pentecost there are? True believers. Okay. How many are going to show up to represent us? 24. So this fits well with the roles we see of the 24 elders in the book of Revelation. Isn't this getting exciting? Yes. Now, some people say the 24 elders are Israel. Well, I just learned that the, the 24 has to be a completed group in heaven before the tribulation period begins. Is that what we just came up with? Okay, now... Israel, at the time of John's vision, put yourself back in 95 A.D. At the time of John's vision, when he's writing this, Israel as a whole nation has not even been redeemed. They're not going to be redeemed till the end of the seven years. The 24 elders in heaven in chapter 4 cannot be Israel. We're going to have a remnant of Israel, but it won't be complete till the end of the seven years. We can scratch them off. Right? Process of elimination. So then some other commentator says, I believe the 24 elders are the tribulation saints. Yeah, some of you are getting it. John's writing, there were no tribulation saints because the tribulation hadn't even happened. So how can these 24 be the tribulation saints? We've got a group of redeemed tribulation saints, but they won't be complete until the end of the seven years. Okay. I hope y'all are in the back or as excited as those of us in the front. <laughs> you are. Good. <laughs> okay. And then some other commentator says, I know who the 24 elders are. They represent all of redeemed mankind since Adam. Okay. The redemption of every redeemed person will not be complete until the end of the thousand years because many people will be saved in the thousand-year kingdom. So, scratch them off. They can't be the group. The church is the only completed group of redeemed people by the time Revelation 4 comes to history. We're the only one. Aren't you glad you're a member of the church? Yes. So, we will be the only complete group, and we're a huge group, but how many are going to be representing us? 24. Boy. Okay. Now, let's look at this. We've got the 24 down. 
But in 1 Chronicles 24 and 25, what was the number 24 associated with? People that were priests and people that would worship. Can we find that with these 24 elders? Let's look. Revelation 4.4. 4. This is the first mention of the 24 elders. First mention is always important in the Bible. They're sitting on a throne, white clothes, and they have a crown on their head. What does verse 4 say? Around the throne, I see 24 thrones, and on the thrones, these 24 elders are sitting. They're clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. 10 and 11. Look what they're doing already. They bow down before the Lord, place their crowns at his feet to give him honor and glory. Are we worshiping? Remember, we've got to have priesthood and worshiping. That's associated with the number 24. And they say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So the 24 elders are casting their crowns at the foot of the throne of God, and they recognize, I have this crown. It is a privilege for me even to be here, and it's all because of the grace of God, all of it. So this reminded me of John 15, 5. He's the vine, you and I are the branch. If you remain in me and I am in you, I will bear much fruit. It will be evident at the judgment seat of Christ when my life is evaluated. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If I'm not abiding in him and him in me, all the works I do are going to be wood, hay, and stubble. So any crown we have, any reward, it's all his grace. It's all his grace, so you want to just give it back to him. That's what's happening. The four and twenty elders, we go to chapter 11 in verse 6, where they're mentioned again. They're worshiping God again. The four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seat, they fall upon their face and they worship God again. And I go to chapter 19, verse 4, and it says the four and twenty elders and now the four beasts are falling down. They worship God and they say, Amen, Alleluia. So all throughout Revelation do I see that they are... Uh, worshiping God which the number 24 in Chronicles tells me they have to worship okay so the 24 elders are highlighted they are participating and imitating worship in the presence of the throne and this angelic host that is there now verse 8 of chapter 5 we're going to move to chapter 5 he takes the scroll and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before the Lamb. They each have a harp, and they have golden bowls that are full of incense, which is the prayer of the saints. Do you see the 24 elders are involved in this? The 24 elders are seen as offering up incense, which is the prayer of the saints, and the offering of incense is clearly reminiscent of a what kind of duty? Priest. So do I see the 24 elders? They are doing exactly what First Chronicles told me the 24 would do, which is priestly duties and worship. Are they fulfilling both? They are fulfilling both. So notice in John 1, 4, John said, Who am I writing to? He's writing to us, the seven churches, and he says in verse 6 of chapter 1, he has made us, us, kings and what? Priest unto God and his Father. And then if I go to Revelation 5.10, I'm going to hear this come out of the mouth of the 24 elders. He has made unto us, unto God, Sorry, he has made us unto our God, kings and what? Priest, and we are going to reign on this earth. That came from the mouth of the 24 elders. 
So we see that they represent the church. They are doing priestly duties, like the Old Testament said, and they're doing worship, just like the Old Testament said. So are they, are they lining up to be our group? Yes, but we're not done. So we need to make sure there's a connection between being the priest and worshiping and the number 24. We saw that in 1 Chronicles 24 and 25. There is, it is linked to these 24 elders who are doing the same thing, same number. Don't miss the connection. It's extremely important. So we're going to compare Revelation 4 and 5, which we just read verses, with the theology of Paul about the church in Ephesians 2. He says the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles who are put into one new body of believers. This is not a continuation of Old Testament theocratic Israel limited to Israel and its land. Is it a new body of Jew and Gentile? So this is the church is totally different from Israel. Totally different. And in verse 9, listen to the song of the 24 elders. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take that scroll. You're worthy to open the seals because you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of what? Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. Is that what Paul said the church would be? Yes, in Ephesians 2. So this is a new unified group of people that they're making up the church. And the Bible tells us there's, there's not Jew and there's not uh, Gentile. We are all one, right? Yes. Out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So this group of unified people that we call the church was not revealed in the Old Testament. True? Never. But they were revealed as a mystery in its full theological significance to Paul the Apostle. You can read about it in Ephesians 3. Therefore, now follow my sentence here. Therefore, since the church was not born until after Jesus ascended, y'all following? On the day of Pentecost, it is no surprise that as a group, they are not in any Old Testament scene because the church wasn't even born or thought about until Paul revealed it over here in the New Testament. So they cannot be in any scene over here. Y'all follow that? Good. So when John writes his vision of what he saw after these things, after the church age, it makes great sense that this, this new 24-member group has to be the recently raptured church. Are y'all with me so far? We're not done. Now, go to Revelation 5, verse 11. They're in the throne room. And God has that sealed uh, deed in his hand. I saw in the right hand of him who's sitting on the throne, he's got a scroll. It is written inside and on the back, and it's sealed up with seven seals. All right? John, who is seeing all this, and he's writing, he starts weeping because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look in it. Now, I saw this for the first time, and it's significant. One of the elders is going to tell John who it is. <laughs> one of the elders. They know. One of the elders says to John, Oh, John, don't weep. You see that lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David? He's triumphed. He's the one worthy to open it. It was an elder that explained it to John. And I'm thinking, why is one of the 24 elders called upon to explain things to John instead of angels? Because usually in the book of Revelation, who's explaining everything? An angel. It's one of those elders that is going to explain this to John. The elders are the only one in that throne room that have personally experienced salvation. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And we're not done. Since John's question relates to salvation, 
It is appropriate that a redeemed individual to note that the Lamb of God, Jesus, is the qualified one to open the scroll. Only one of the elders has experienced salvation. Okay, John's weeping because he knew his destiny and all of humanity depends on finding somebody qualified to open that scroll. It's the deed to planet Earth, and if no one's able to open it, the redemption of Earth and mankind could not even be carried out. So, in verse 9, they are singing. This is the 24 elders. They're singing a new song. You are worthy to take this book. You're worthy to open the seals, and you have redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people and nation Israel cannot say that unbelievers can't say it only the church can say that you've made us unto our God kings and priests that's what John told them in chapter 1 they're repeating it in chapter 5 and we are going to reign on the earth oh it got to be late okay Another description that helps bring understanding to the identity of these 24 elders has to do with the description of the Lamb's spatial position. Okay. John introduces Jesus in Revelation 1.13. He's like a son of man, and he is standing in the midst of, the Greek word is mesos, of these lampstands. Now, this is in Revelation 1.20. I've just got a picture, so you have a little visual there. He's standing in the middle of the lampstands, and the seven lampstands are who? The churches. And that's going to be seven times in Revelation. There's lots of sevens in Revelation. Now, if I go to Revelation 2.1, this is the very first letter he writes to Ephesus. He says, how does he present himself? Jesus presents himself, I'm the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And they are who? The church. Don't forget that. And it's, he's in the midst of them. Now, I want you to go to Revelation 5, 1 to 14. Now we're in the throne room. I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders... I'm giving y'all a few minutes to get it and shout. <laughs> He's in the midst of those 24 elders. He had been in the midst of the churches over here. I believe they are now here. We're showing more and more that these 24 elders have to be the churches, and now he's standing in the midst of them. So within the book itself, it seems John directs us to understand there is a link between him being in the midst of the seven lampstands, which are the seven churches in chapter 1, and in chapter 5, he says he is now in the midst of the 24 elders. Okay, I think that's a compelling connection. Now, so the 24 elders who represent the church, they're seated in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5 before the tribulation period ever starts in Revelation 6. Now, this is something I'd never seen. I've been working up to this part of the lesson. And this was fascinating. I began to think, if I took the promises that he made to the churches, do I see that that promise is fulfilled in those 24 elders to keep showing they are the church? So, you and I are going to look at some of the promises he made to the churches to those who overcome Question, are all of us in position an overcomer in Jesus Christ? Do we all experience overcoming? Sometimes are we overwhelmed and defeated? Okay, these promises are those two who overcome. Remember that. So let's look at them. We'll go through these. Number one. The 24 elders who I believe represented the church, they're seated in heaven, Revelation 4 and 5. They are exempt from the period of the tribulation that we begins in 6-1, just like he promised the church in Revelation 3, the church of Philadelphia. 
And he said, I will keep you from the hour of testing, the hour that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So do we see a promise he made here as being fulfilled in the 24 elders? Okay, number two. The 24 elders, they represent, I believe, the entire church body. They are seated on thrones. Did it say that? They're seated on a throne. Was that a promise to one of the churches? Yes, and that was a promise in Revelation 3.21, actually to the church of Laodicea. And he said, those who overcome, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame, and I am now sat down with my father on his throne. Are we promised to sit with him on a throne yes now remember that's to the people who overcome I don't think this is to the people who are all wood hay and stubble just keep all this in mind because we're at the judgment seat this is the tribulation period coming up we've got the millennial kingdom I think eternity is different I'm only talking about the millennial kingdom okay so where was I Oh, it's fascinating, yes, to see the consistency in the Bible. In the Old Testament, in the temple, in the tabernacle, there was never a chair. Never. They couldn't sit down because the priests were to serve continually. But after Jesus performed his high priestly duties, he sat down at the right hand of God because it was done. So angels are never sitting in the Bible. They're standing even Gabriel, the majestic angel, he says, I am standing in the presence of God. Angels are specifically labeled as distinct from the 24 elders. Let's go to a couple of passages, Revelation 5.11 and 7.11. It says, the angel stood about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. What I'm trying to show you here is that the angels are a separate group from the 24 elders. It is a separate group. Now, the reference to the 24 thrones on which the 24 elders sat indicates they are reigning with Jesus Christ. An angel is never sitting on a throne. They're never pictured as ruling and reigning. Angels have a specific purpose given to us in Hebrews 1.14. They are, says angels, are they not all ministering spirits? They're sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. That's us. So they're sent to minister to us. I have a couple of observations in Revelation 7.9. There is the tribulation saints are called a great multitude of them. They are martyred and they are standing before the Lamb and the throne of God. They're not sitting on a throne. Revelation 15, 2. There's another group of martyred individuals who had victory over the beast and they're standing near the throne. They're not sitting. It's interesting. It's amazing only one group specifically labeled as sitting and it's the 24 elders and they are shown to be sitting on a throne dressed in white raiment clean and bright with a crown on their head it's the only group so number three the 24 elders who represent this complete church body serve as kings we cannot even imagine what God has for us Revelation 1, 5, and 6, John said, Unto him that loved us, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's made us kings and priests. Unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. In Revelation 5, 10, these are the words out of the mouth of the 24 elders. He has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we will reign on the earth. The word reign is, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. We'll just go on. It's number 936. 
and it means to be king, to exercise kingly power. And in the Strong's references, it says this speaks of the reign of Christians in the millennium. The 24 elders, number four, who represent the church, it says they're sitting clothed in white raiment in Revelation 4.4. 4. When did Jesus promise that to the overcomers? The church of Sardis. And he says, you have a few people in Sardis who haven't soiled their garment. Now I'm going to stop right there a minute. Remember, we cannot soil our garment of justification. That is the garment we are given when we are justified. It is the garment of his righteousness, the robe of his righteousness that we all get. Can I soil my garment of sanctification? Yes. It's, a, it's a, based on my obedience and my daily walk and so forth. Am I keeping my vessel clean? That's one I can soil. And he says, you got a few people there in Sardis who haven't soiled their garment. And listen what he says about them. They get to walk with me in white because they are worthy. That is a significant statement. He who overcomes shall be clothed in a white garment. This is very sobering for you and me. If you're listening to what that says. Now, at the marriage of the Lamb, it says his bride will clothe herself in fine linen, clean and white. And that fine linen, clean and white is what? The righteous acts of the saints. This is all on my life. How have I lived as a believer? What has my life been like? Have I been obedient? Are all of, I want all of us to get that. This garment that we are making. It's on our obedience. Now, there are other groups in Revelation that are given a white robe, but it's a different designation. I've given you the references, and it's a different Greek word than the one used for the ones for the bride. Number five, the church is repeatedly promised that we will co-reign with Jesus Christ. If we go to Revelation 2, 26 and 7, this was a promise to the church at Thyatira, and they're the ones that had the spirit of Jezebel. So this was, this was the dark ages. He who overcomes, and if you keep my deeds to the end, I'm going to give authority over the nations. He's going to rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my Father. Passages in Romans 8. If we are children, then we're an heir and an heir of God. Right? I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ if I suffer with him. That we may also be glorified together. And it goes on to say, I consider the sufferings that I'm going through in this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. We have got to live in light of eternity and remember these things in our daily lives. Second Timothy 2.12 says, if I suffer, that doesn't mean suffering. It's suffering for the sake of Christ. If I suffer, I shall also reign with him. Number six, the 24 elders are wearing crowns of gold. As Jesus promised to the loyal believers. Sorry. Yeah, the loyal believers. And this comes from Revelation 2.10. This is the church at Smyrna, the persecuted church. He says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. This is for people who will suffer for the name of Christ, especially any that will lay their life down for him. <coughs> In the Bible, there are five different crowns, which are symbolic descriptions of the rewards for faithful service. These are called Stephanos or victor's crowns that will be won, worn by those who have successfully endured the trials and competed, their, competed in their race and won the victory. 1 uh, Corinthians 9.25 Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or moderate in all things. Is there a lot of self-discipline? Yes. 
They do it to obtain a perishable crown. We are working for a crown that will last forever. Keep that in mind every day. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.19, there's a crown of rejoicing. Paul says, <coughs> sorry, who is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? How, he's talking about the souls that he has won that will be present with him. That's his joy. This is called the soul winner's crown. In James 1.12, <clears throat> he says, Blessed is a man who will endure his trials, because when he passes the test, he will receive a crown of life that he has promised to those that love him. And then there is a crown of glory in 1 Peter 5, 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory for those who faithfully teach and preach God's word. In 2 Timothy 4, 8, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to also all those who have loved his appearing. Am I to be looking for him every day? Be ready to stand before him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, I believe, as we put all these puzzle pieces together, we now have more clarity as to who this 24 group, uh, group is. The church will be the only completely redeemed group of people by the time Revelation 4 happens in history. It hasn't happened yet. We look at their titles, we look at their clothing, we look at their crowns, we look at their thrones and the activities of worship and priesthood. I believe it's clear that they are the newly raptured church. What are they doing? In chapter 5, they are singing the song of redemption. And they're from every tribe, tongue, nation. That's only the church. They have crowns on. They're seated on thrones. In Revelation 5, it presents the plan for tribulation judgment that's contained in that scroll. And the lamb is the only one worthy to open it. And an elder had to explain it to John. I thought that was interesting. So Jesus, think of this throne room, and they're talking about it. Jesus has invited the 24 elders to sit in his immediate presence. He's going to open those seals now. Start fulfilling his kingly role as he is going to redeem the earth back to righteousness. And the 24 elders have a front row seat. Revelation 6 now will portray the opening of each seal. This will initiate the cause of all the judgments that are going to fall on the earth. And this means all 19 of the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments are in that scroll. And none of them are released until chapter 6. None of it. And where have we been for two chapters? We've been seated in the throne room of God. The 24 elders in heaven, they're there before the tribulation period ever starts. I believe this supports the church's blessed hope that we have a pre-trib rapture. So what am I to be doing? Paul tells us, I am looking daily. I'm living daily and looking for my blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you.